Hello everyone, my name is Caleb Collins and I'm a leader in the student ministry here at CIV and I've been a member for nearly eight years with my wife and six kids. I'm excited to share with you all today, largely because this church has just been such a blessing to our family and I hope to reciprocate that and hopefully bless y'all today. Also, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there, including my own. Thank you for protecting, providing, and presiding wisdom over your homes and the impact that you make in your own children and ultimately our church as well. It would not be the same without you. Thank you, dads. And on the note of dads, as I continue our Bible Stories message series, I thought it would be fitting to talk about one of the strongest men ever to walk the face of the planet. No, it's not Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger in their prime, though he is reminiscent of an action hero. His name, you've probably heard of him, is Samson. Samson was a political military leader of the people of Israel about a thousand years before Christ. His story can be found in the Old Testament book of the Bible named Judges, which refers to the 12 unique leaders God graciously raised up to deliver his people when they were oppressed as a result of their disobedience. Judges is a tragic sequel to the book of Joshua. In Joshua, the people were obedient to God and enjoyed victory in their conquest of the promised land. In Judges, however, they are disobedient, idolatrous, and often defeated and oppressed. Though Israel obeyed God's commands at first and obediently worked to drive out the inhabitants of the promised land, when it came time to pass the baton to the next generation, it was dropped. Here's a picture of the U.S. team doing that in the Olympics. A devastating sound when that hits the, hits the track. Whew. Sends chills up anybody's spine. In the track and field events, the 4x100 meter relay is a very exciting and uh, awe-inspiring race. Everyone gets into it. You have four athletes running their hearts out across, uh, across to do one lap around the track, handing off this baton, well, maybe not this one, handing off the baton three times before they're all said and done. The most stressful part for me as a coach was when it was time to exchange it. You have the one runner coming in as fast as they can, the other one trying to time it perfectly to leave so they can get up to speed, reach their hand back, grab the baton, a blind exchange is what we call that, not looking, right? And then get out and then do it again and one more time before it's all said and done. Unfortunately, in my first time coaching this event, our girls and our guys teams dropped the very first exchange. Um, so the baton hit the ground and all the other legs of the race were just left there, not able to compete that day. It was really sad and discouraging. Luckily, we did much better as the season progressed and even broke a school record, but um, the unfortunate story of judges, like the first track meet that I ever coached, is that it is the tragedy of a botched exchange between one generation who came before and was faithful to God and the succeeding ge generation who was faithless. Joshua 2, 10 through 14 says it this way, And all the generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to plunderers, who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so they could no longer withstand their enemies. This sounds devastating. And the fact that this new generation of Israelites did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel, think about all the amazing things that the Lord had done for Israel at this point. If you don't know, you probably know some references to these stories. Moses parting the Red Sea, like Pharaoh and his whole army drowning when they're trying to come and get him, Ten Commandments coming down from a mountain, God walking, not walking, God leading before the people of Israel in a cloud and a pillar of fire, providing manna from heaven, water from rocks, these are stories that you would talk about at dinner, right? If you had been there. But somehow there's a generation that rises up and they don't know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And this leads them to horrible oppression by their enemies. So what happened? How was this one generation who actually was faithful to God? They had courage to go fight against giants. I don't know about you, but I'm not signing up first to go fight a giant. Although I was named after one of the guys who went, Caleb. Aha. He was a good one. But it's a scary thing to go and, and battle and trust God when the odds are against you. But they did it over and over again. That seems pretty faithful to me. How did the faith of the father not get to the children? The Bible doesn't tell us all the details. 
but it does tell us what we're supposed to do as parents. It tells us that it's our job, as Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 says, to talk of these things with our children. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says that the parents are to teach their ch children diligently, and they shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Verse 8 and 9 say, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The commandments of the Lord were supposed to surround every aspect of home life. And here at Church in the Valley, we are committed to helping parents to do just this, to help raise up not just the next generation, but the next righteous generation. In fact, even this next fall, Pastor Matt and his team, they're offering a new co-op for you and your children to participate in. More information will be sent out. Actually, it has been sent out this week. I encourage you to check your emails. Um, but the, the aim of this co-op is to equip our kids through Christian education to advance God's kingdom in their generation. So it's not just about us adults right now and what we're trying to do, but it's those that are coming behind us. So regardless of the means, the truth remains. We cannot afford to leave the next generation behind. As we push, we must pull. As we push the kingdom of God forward, we must pull the next generation along as well. We cannot do one without the other. And if we don't, we're going to experience the same results that the people experienced back in the book of Judges. They got stuck in a cycle, like the spin cycle, when your washing machine is going so fast, it sounds like it's going to take off and go to space. Maybe that's just my experience. But they got stuck in this cycle. The people sin. God gets angry. He allows them to be oppressed. They cry out. And then salvation comes through an appointed judge that rose up. They have peace for a time. The leader dies. The next generation can't get the baton. It's good for that one leg of the race, and they just keep dropping it. So they've dropped it at this point 11 times, and now we get to the story of Samson. And unfortunately, the judges over time have stopped looking like a distinguished good guy, leader of the people. So they've gone from good to bad to just worse, and that's Samson. And Samson, his story it personifies the failures, not just of his, himself, but of all of God's people at this time. Their failure to keep the covenant with God. Both Samson and the people of God, they start with great promise and gifting. They pursue what is right in their own eyes, so they're not faithful to the covenant with God. And then they experience the self-induced difficulty and ultimate tragedy. But starting with great blessing and gifting, we see in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, this singling out of one singular human, Abram. And God comes to him and he says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in Abram, the people of God would be so blessed. It would just be overflowing out of their life that the whole world would be blessed through them. That doesn't sound like the description of the Israelites that I just read. And it's not going to sound like the description of the Israelites by the time we get to the end of our time together. But they started with promise, a great promised blessing. And so, subsequently, does, does uh, Samson in Judges chapter 13. He has quite the promising start. His mom can't have children, but an angel of the Lord appears to her. And he says, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. So Samson starts off as a miracle baby, born to a barren woman, joining the ranks of other miracle babies, such as Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Samuel, and even Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Samson is also given a very specific path to follow. As a Nazarite, Samson was to avoid all wine, strong drink, unclean foods. He was never supposed to cut his hair, nor was he allowed to go near any dead thing, not even family members' funerals. As, and why? As a Nazarite, Samson was set aside to be holy. He was to avoid these things as a sign of his devotion, loyalty, and respect towards God. 
He was to be an example to the people of Israel. And lastly, Samson's promising start shows us that he was intended to be a hero. Samson was chosen to begin a deliverance that would have been about 60 years in the making by the time he reaches fighting age. And you also see that Samson is frequently empowered with this strength from, from the Lord that is just other world. It is really supernatural. He picks up gates from the ground and just walks them up a hill. He tears apart animals that should tear apart him. He slays men, thousands of them, with a primitive weapon, a bone. Samson really has a promising start. But as the story of Samson unfolds, it becomes tragically clear that he, like the nation of Israel, has no regard for the God of his forefathers, the God who gave him this promise. Because we see in Samson that he's exceedingly promiscuous, violent, and arrogant. Samson often pursues, not just Samson, but Israel too, pursues what is right in his own eyes. This phrase circulates uh, and it gets more and more as the book of Judges carries on to show you, the reader, the faithlessness of the people, turning away from God and just doing what's right in their own eyes. Their God becomes the one, so to speak, in the mirror. And so we, th we see this with Samson. Samson explicitly breaks God's commands and his father's warning by intermarrying with a Philistine woman, which God had said would turn Israel's sons from following him and would result in rapid, fury-filled judgment from God. We also see that Israel just itself as a people are doing what's right in their own eyes. As I mentioned before, that the latter chapters of the book, this phrase picks up more and more. And in Judges 17, we see this odd story of Micah, um, who kind of starts this grassroots pagan religion out of his own house. He has some stolen money. He gives it back to his mom. His mom's like, oh, right, great. Thanks for giving me the money back. Let's make an idol. They make an idol. They make some priestly garments to go along with it and then anoint the grandson as a priest. Later, a random walker by comes by. He happens to be from a priestly tribe, so they anoint him to also be a priest in their home. It's kind of odd. They start their own thing, and they say it's unto the Lord. It's because they've abandoned what the Lord actually says. They, they should have known, right? The Lord revealed who was, be, who was to be a priest, that they shouldn't have any idols before him, the Ten Commandments, right? These things were revealed. But we get to the end of Judges and the people don't know it. They just know what's right in their own eyes and they put a stamp on it and say, yep, that's from God. Sound familiar? Happens a lot today. And as you pursue what is right to you, what is it, your truth, even if you put a godly spin on it, you're ultimately going to break ties with God, who commands your wholehearted devotion and nothing else. Thus, Samson and Israel both are not faithful to their covenant with God. Number six gives a detailed explanation of what the Nazarite vow really meant. So Samson, not supposed to drink wine, cut his hair, go near the dead, but we also see him kill frequently. As I alluded to before, there, there's a time where he's going to see this, this woman, the one that he was like, hey, she's right in my own eyes, I want to go marry her. His dad says no, but he goes, no, get her for me, she's right in my eyes. He's on this mission, which is disobedient. He's on his disobedient mission, and on the way he gets attacked by a lion. God gives him strength, and he tears that lion apart. In the Nazarite vow that we see in Numbers chapter 6, if he were to kill something or someone, he was supposed to go and then cut his hair and offer two turtle doves and, and to reinstate his vow. He would, have, he would have brought uncleanliness on him by being next to the dead. But we don't see Samson do this. Actually, he keeps it on the down low. It says that he doesn't tell his father or his mother what he had done. Later, on the same path... He sees honey inside of, inside of this lion. He must have been hungry. Sprouts wasn't open yet. So he goes and he pulls the honey out of, I guess, the chest cavity. I'm not really sure. He pulls the honey out of the lion and then eats it and gives it to his parents when, he's, when he gets time with them. And it says again that he does not tell his father or mother what he had done. Now, you've all been kids before. It is Father's Day. So, fathers, you can also remember when you were a boy and you did something and then you knew you would get in trouble for that, and so you just didn't tell mom or dad. Kids also, you know this. You tell them if they asked, but they didn't ask. So mom and dad didn't say to Samson, hey, where'd you get this honey? This is really good. I wonder if he would have lied to them at that point, but they don't ask according to the text that we have. And why does Samson not tell them? Because his parents know, and he knows he'd get in trouble. Numbers chapter 6 
tells us that he's not supposed to touch the dead. And he needs to follow certain processes to recommit his vow. And his parents knew that. His parents were the first one that were told about his Nazarite vow to begin with. But then you'd see Samson, who probably had hair down to here at this point, right? He was between 20 and 30 years of age, so that's some long hair. You'd see him cutting that off. It would be clear to everyone around him that he did something wrong, that he broke his vow. But actually, for him to do that would have been the faithful thing to do. But instead, he pursues what's right in his own eyes. Keeps going on his merry way. So con consequently, both Samson and Israel, they experience a self-induced difficulty. The Bible talks about if you sow unto the sin, unto, unto the flesh, you're going to reap a harvest of destruction, of pain. Samson is a perfect story for that. Showing that example. Judges 13.1 shows that the reason the Israelites were being oppressed for 40 plus years by the Philistines was that they did what was evil in God's eyes. They had been planting seeds of evil things and the fruit that grew? Punishment. Samson also, we see him get himself into a ton of trouble due to his own reckless living. Yes, he was super strong, but he was not super wise. Samson gets into some pretty tight spots because of his anger, his strong drive for vengeance, and his, weak, his weakness for manipulative women, as well as his arrogance that he could counter any obstacle that came his way. Samson often has to like just punch his way out of all these self-induced difficulties. For the most part, early on in his story, it works. But just as even the greatest boxers of all time are subject to a perfectly timed knockout to the jaw, Samson and the people of Israel have tragic endings in the book of Judges. Check out Judges 16.30. And it's here that we see Samson is worn down by his foreign love interest at the time. So this precedes verse 30. The story is told of him finding this love interest, Delilah. She's of the Philistines as well. And she's bribed. She's bribed to find out the source of Samson's strength. So Delilah nags, and she nags, and she nags, and she nags. And Samson lies to her a few times, but then finally he can't take it anymore. And he just tells her, I've never cut my hair. If my hair is cut, I'll become as weak as any other man. So what she do? She gets him to fall asleep, cuts his hair, and then says, Hey, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. As a result, Samson is quickly attacked blinded, and enslaved, and then forced to entertain his very enemies. Similarly, Israel, in the closing four chapters of the book, just dives headlong into their sin. They behave in shocking manners. If you read these chapters, Judges 17 through 21, get ready, for it's not a, not a story that you might think initially would be in the Bible. And you see Israel behave in shocking manners, like I said, including ravishment, dismemberment, twisted idolatry, civil war, tons of death, not even like against their enemy, against each other. And then at the end, there's a lot of kidnapping and stealing of women for some other tribe's wives. It gets pretty, um, pretty dark for the chosen people of God who were promised to be a blessing, to overflow with blessings so much that the whole world would be blessed through them. So now we have this, this nation, we have this judge that's just unrecognizable, undistinguishable from the people around them who worship false gods and for their own worship practices do horrible things including child sacrifice and sexual promiscuity. And that's the story of Samson. But why do we look into these stories? Well, as Pastor Thad said a few weeks ago, God has preserved these stories in the Bible as a means for us to grow closer to Him. Just like when your kids say, Mommy, Daddy, tell me a story about when you were little. Dad said his kids do that. My kids do that all the time. I'm kind of running out of stories. I've got to tell them stories about, I don't know. I actually have to ask them, like, can you be more specific? You want a story about me playing a sport or me when I went swimming? I don't know. Like, I'm out of stories. But the reason they want to know these stories, is they want to draw closer to me. And that's a sweet thing. God gives us this story, even a tragic story like the story of Judges and Samson, for us to come closer to Him. And some of the things we can pull out of this is first that a first lesson is that God is nobody's homeboy. Maybe you've heard that phrase before or seen the shirt. I think it actually started out here initially. Um, but when I was in middle school, there was a popular t-shirt floating around with a picture of Jesus on the front, holding his fingers kind of like this, pointing at his chest. And it said in big, bold letters, 
Jesus is my homeboy. Now, middle school, this was kind of a cool way to identify that you were a Christian, but like you were a cool one. You weren't one of those, one of those crazy Christians. You were, you were like homies with Jesus. And so, while this might be humorous for a t-shirt, it definitely is a mistake. Because it mistakenly brings God down to our level as if he's just one of the guys. Which, yes, Jesus came and he lived as a human. Jesus hung out with outcasts and sinners. But Jesus is not your homeboy. He is not just one of the guys. The truth is, is that there's never a time in your life where you can step out of bounds with God. Whether that's sexually, financially, personally, or anywhere that God says this is the way it ought to be, and you go this way. There's no time that God's just going to shrug it off and say, it's cool. We're homies. No. God says what you sow, you will reap. When you step out of bounds, you'll be disciplined for it. And this can be seen in Samson's life as he carelessly, at the end of his life, reveals a secret of his strength to Delilah. And then, once his hair is cut, he thinks to himself that he will be able to defeat the Philistines as he did before he broke his Nazarite vow. But this is not the case. In Judges 16, 20, it says, And she, Delilah, says, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep, and he said, I will go out as other times and shake myself free. Just at other times, men are attacking you, and he just kind of shakes himself, and they fall off. Powerful. But he did not know, the key words here, he did not know the Lord had left him. The Lord is disciplining him right here. Yes, of course, the Lord is the source of all his strength. No one could be that supernaturally strong without God stepping in. But Samson had stepped out of bounds with God, and as a result, he lost his strength. He lost this fight. He lost his eyes. They plucked him out, and he lost his freedom. They enslaved him and made him grind in a mill like he was a beast of burden. And Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 reminds us of God's position relative to us. You know, our discernment process can get messed up as we're trying to, like, what's God's will? And we start to maybe sometimes think that I can figure it out all on my own. I'm like the source. Like, God gave me discernment. He gave me the Holy Spirit, so I can just figure it out. Well, let's read this verse and, and think about that for a second. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Boom. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is on a whole nother level. The HNL. He's a whole nother level than us. And Samson didn't understand that God's ways are way beyond him and that he serves God and not the other way around. And Samson's story also shows us that doing what is right in your own eyes leads only to blindness. By pursuing what is right in your own eyes, whether it's honey from a dead lion or a foreign love interest or getting revenge whenever he felt like it, Samson started himself in this downward spiral that he could not return from. Like when the kids are trying to run up the slide, but they got their slippery socks on, they just keep falling back down. Samson was going down and going down fast. And in the end, satisfying what his eyes wanted cost him the ability to see anything at all. Romans 1.21 puts it this way, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Diving into what you think is right when the Bible clearly says it's wrong will eventually leave you worse off than Samson. You'll be unable to discern light from darkness, good from bad, and incapable of comprehending truth. But, the story of Samson shows us that there is hope. Your hair can grow back too. I know it's Father's Day. Some of you are like, no, really, Caleb, my hair is not growing back. But stay with me here for a little bit. We're not necessarily just talking about Rogaine. In Judges 16, 22, it says, But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. In this part of the story, Samson's blind, tied up, grinding in a mill with the enemy, and has no strength. But his hair begins to grow back. And so we've already seen that his hair was significantly tied to his Nazarite vow, and as he expressed to Delilah, also his supernatural strength that God provided. And this phrase has been of great encouragement to me because it comes when Samson is at his absolute lowest. I read this and I see that God has not left him even in his downtrodden, self-indulgent, enslaved, and rebellious state. I see that God is not done with Samson. And perhaps when I am low too, I can think that God is also not done with me. Whether that's failing as a father, 
as a husband, as an employee, and just feeling like I've done wrong. Maybe I have, but God is not done with me. I'm still alive. You repent and your hair can grow back too. So the next time you royally screw up, I want you to think about the verse. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. And then call out to God for deliverance. For God promises in 1 Peter 5.10 that after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And finally, Samson's story shows God's faithfulness to us despite our faithlessness to him. At the end of his story, blind, weakened, and humiliated, Samson is paraded around and entertain, to entertain thousands of Philistines in the temple to their God, whom they believe had delivered him into their hands. And Samson says to the young man that's tending in the area, he says, hey, help me fill the pillars so that I can have a place to, to lean on. So the boy pulls him over to where the pillars, the support pillars of the temple are. And then we see Samson's second prayer of the whole, the whole story that we have for Samson. And he says, Oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. Oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Flashback, before Samson was even born, God had predestined him to begin routing the Philistines away from the people of Israel. And though Samson was faithless, promiscuous, arrogant, when he calls, the Lord answers immediately. And this is the story of the gospel. The good news of God's character, as shown in 2 Timothy 2.13, is that if we are faithless, as Samson was, as Israel was, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. At the core of who God is, is this faithfulness. It's a core part of him. And he's faithful to us. Thus, we can trust God to be there when we call. And we can trust Him to accomplish His plans for us, even despite our own shortcomings. As Psalm 138, 8 says, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And like Samson, our hair, not just physical, but circumstantially, our hair can grow back too. Though we destroy our own lives, our jobs, our relationships, and even our own health, we can be restored back to God if we just call out to Him. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise. It's not just for salvation. If you're a Christian and you've been a Christian for a number of years, that's still to you. You can call out to God. Samson did it on his dying, I don't know, it's not a deathbed, death pillars. You can call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And though you may feel as if you've been walking or running away for God, from God for days or months or even years, if you were to turn around right at this very moment, you would find that you've really just been on a treadmill the whole time, putting forth a whole lot of what feels like effort and miles and distance between you and God, only to turn around and see that He's been there the whole time. You don't have any ground to make up because you can't. That's why you just call and you ask for help. You say, my strength is, my strength is gone. And that's what Jesus came to do. He knows that you're weak. All of us are like Samson. They're blind, weakened, and in need. And that's where God shows up. Because He's faithful to you regardless if you're faithful to Him. And as we close, I'd just like to suggest a few next steps that you could put into practice after this message. Invest, admit, and ask. Number one, you can invest in the next generation by fill in the blank yourself. Some ideas could be volunteering in the kids' zone here at Church in the Valley, enrolling your child in CIV's co-op that's coming up, sponsoring someone else's child to participate in the co-op. Or, if you're a little older, student ministry out there, you guys can volunteer to, to babysit uh, for other couples in the church. And then don't just show up and, and watch TV, but show up and invest in those kids. Come, up, come with games and stories to play with them. The kids think you're heroes already. Invest in them. Help pass the baton to the next generation. They already look up to you. Number two, admit 
You can admit to the Lord, Lord, I have been doing what is right in my own eyes in this area of my life. Maybe it hasn't been intentional right away, but then here you are. You've just been doing what's right in your own eyes in this area. And say, God, will you forgive me and help me align with your ways? And last, you can ask. You can ask God to restore a certain area of your life that has been in shambles lately, recalling that your hair can grow back too, and that God is just one call away. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this tragic story of Samson and how it is not far from just the, the tragic example and lives of, of all humanity. And on the, on the dying moments, he cries out to you and you show up and you provide strength and deliverance. God, you, you'll provide that for us too. And I pray who, whoever's listening to this, whoever's praying with me right now, God, that you would, um, you would speak to their hearts, God, that they would know that you are just a call away and that you are faithful even if they've been faithless. They don't have to make up the miles between them and you. Um, they can say, God, I need you. I need you to show up. Uh, I'm sorry. I've, I've done what's right in my own eyes. I ask you to restore me. I pray that in Jesus' name.